I'd like to start with um, a discussion as I was sitting there, uh, very moved by what Michael was saying, the difficulty that our clients um, have to live with every day, and not just our clients, but their families. So I was reminded of conversations I have every single week with two women. Um, one of them is a mother of a girl who was 19 years old, who was stabbed to death after having been uh, raped. Uh, and there's a man in prison who's one of my clients who claims he's innocent, that he had nothing to do with this. And she heard about, through the press, that I was working on this case. And I, um, I got the message to call this woman. I didn't know who it was. She started calling, and I suddenly recognized the last name and thought, oh my God, this is that I've never talked to the victim's mom. And um, she answers the phone, and I immediately give my kind of disclaimer. I'm working with a guy who's you know, convicted of killing your daughter, raping and killing your daughter. I don't know what I can do for you. And she said, I don't know what happened to my daughter. Enough doubt had been brought into her mind by the work that we were doing that she says she doesn't know. Now that puts a huge responsibility on us, right? I mean, what you want to give is these people peace. But she knows there were certainly more than my client because we've shown, that actually the police have shown, that the semen that was left on her daughter's body does not belong to the man who's in prison. So someone else at least did the right. I, I believe the man who's in prison had nothing to do with this. He continues to name people he thinks might be involved. He's named 30 people. They've tested all 30 people. And I keep saying to the district attorney, what do you think he's doing? Why would he continue to name people if he knew the right person? What would he possibly gain from this? The other mother who calls me every week um, is the mother of a girl, a woman, who was 19 when she was arrested and convicted of stabbing repeatedly a woman, lighting her car on fire, uh, and leaving her to die. And she's another one of our clients. And the reason I brought up these two moms is I know Michael's trying to encourage you to do more than due diligence. You have to do undue diligence. You have to be your client's mother if you're going to deal with people in post-conviction because everything is stacked against you. Um, and you have to realize what kind of work you're getting into. You are going to the bottom of a manure pit, you know, looking for a geode that may have something inside it. That's really what we do. It is not easy work. It's not for the weak at heart. Most of the probably over 100 students I've worked with have never been on an exoneration. One student, uh, Cliff, has been on two of them. And that's because Cliff is the guy who went to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation and when they told us that all of the rape kits were destroyed in 1990 and so he couldn't possibly get a hold of this evidence to test, he went to the evidence room and asked the kind woman who works there, would you please do a manual check? And she did and found a box of evidence that freed one of our clients and that led to the arrest of the real perpetrator more than 20 years after the fact. That is undue diligence. It's something that I'm kind of scared to do, right? I, I've never had to do that. Uh, but Cliff was willing to do it. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit through some casework examples of um, some of the issues that I think are important uh, and that will help you. Um, but really, this work has to be very creative because it is dumping into, diving into a pit of manure and trying to find something important. So. Um, how do we measure the justice system? You know, I mean, justice holds those scales, presumably because um, she is, this will kick on in a second, I'm told, she is measuring something. So how can we judge the system? How do we measure the system? Well, if we, if we judge it the way the law and order politicians would have us judge it, by the number of truly guilty people who are convicted, and the Salem Witch Trials are a marvelous success because more than 100% of the witches were convicted. If that's our measure of justice, just the truly guilty put behind bars, then we're doing a great job, I think. The problem is we're supposed to be looking for those innocents and continually retooling the system, continually fighting for rights that assure the best outcome, the truthful outcome. Uh, and it takes a lot of work because those rights are constantly being threatened. Okay, I have one lawyer jump. It's an original, so I feel like I'm um, 
What's the difference between a criminal defense lawyer and a normal person? I told this recently to a bunch of DUI lawyers, but anyway. A um, normal person's worst nightmare is a murderer, a kidnapper, or a rapist. What is a criminal defense attorney's worst nightmare? An innocent client. Um, and it's true, and I think most criminal defense attorneys would agree that most of the cases they handle, they are happy if they get a deal where the punishment's cut in half. Um, they really are convinced at some point, though they may not admit it, and because they're doing due diligence, they're not going to say it, that their client probably is guilty or certainly is going to be found guilty, and if they can get a reduced sentence, they're very happy with that. But the truly innocent client is a nightmare. So I thought for years, because I know this statistic, I know that when I talk to criminal defense attorneys, they will say, no, I haven't had hundreds of cases where someone was innocent. They, they don't think they have those cases. Um, I used to think for years that there just weren't that many innocent people and, um, in prison. And so I, I, in Houston about um, a month ago, Michael and I were in Houston at the Innocence Network meeting. There were about 60 exonerees there, and I had a table discussion at breakfast um, with a group of them uh, talking about some issues, and I said, by the way, how many of you guys, your first lawyer, thought you were innocent? And of the four guys there, three of them started laughing. <laughs> These are all people who were in prison for more than a decade, uh, two of them for more than two decades. And uh, one of them said, well, he might have, one out of four. So that's not a good measure either. Just because you're convinced, even as the initial defense attorney, doesn't mean you're dealing with somebody who's guilty. Um, and Michael asked me to uh, talk about the, the difference in approach between a typical forensic case, and I do work cases for uh, the prosecution as well, uh, and an innocence forensic case. And I'll, I'll tell you, they're completely different. I just wrote a, a play where time goes backwards. And, and that was easy for me, because everything I do is thinking backwards. You start out with a presumption of guilt that you have to fight against. Um, if you read a trial where someone was found guilty, you will most likely walk away thinking they were guilty. I mean, juries aren't crazy. You know, some, some of them are, I suppose. But um, generally, you know, you read a transcript, and um, if people did a good job, you, you might come to the same conclusion. The DNA often tells a different story. Innocent people make the worst clients. You should know that. They're going to talk to the police. They're going to entertain hypotheticals. They can't make a deal. They're stubborn, they constantly say they're innocent, they won't admit any kind of guilt until they come to a false confession. That happens in about 22% of the cases that we've seen um, across the nation in the United States. 22% of the time when someone has been found innocent through DNA, unequivocally innocent, they had confessed at some point to the crime. Um, they can't implicate others. At sentencing, there's no remorse. They can't complete the rape offender program. Um, a number of my clients started in it, and then they get to the point where, well, now tell us about the crime, right? They go around the room. And um, I always ask them, what did you say? Um, uh, Calvin Johnson, who I wrote the book, Exit to Freedom, with, said, um, I'll tell you what the lady said in court. I wasn't there. I'll tell you what she said. And he was booted out. So he ended up doing more time <coughs> than he would have if he had just said he did it and was sorry. Um, the victims aren't usually willing to make a deal with somebody with, or to allow the prosecutors to, uh, to lower the charges or anything because these guys aren't sorry. And these guys and women, I should say. And the parole board can't reasonably release some who's under him. Those are some of the challenges. So now we have DNA, right? So DNA should take care of all of these problems because the four cases where I was a part of them uh, that we were able to free people through DNA. Those were cases where DNA had not been done before. So everybody says to me, well, now that we have DNA, right, we don't really need an innocence project. But um, I want to show you, um, this is last month, one of my cases in Atlanta. This guy is still in, uh, in prison. But this is what we did. We had a case where um, a man is in prison, two men are actually in prison, because a third man whose DNA clearly implicates him, um, says that these other two men also gang raped this woman. Okay, so three men raped a woman. One guy is identified by the woman. It's clearly, his DNA is clearly in the profile, we all agree. And they ask him, who else did it? Why? Because if you make a deal, your sentence is reduced. 
years. So he gave them some names, um, and uh, and this is what happened. Actually, that's part two. Let me get part two. So I've been working on this case for a couple of years now, and this reporter from Fox News was very interested in it, and I tried to explain what a mixture of DNA is like. And I said, it's like a, a bowl, a glass bowl, and you take three names from three people in the audience, you stick them in there, and you mix all those three names in, in like Scrabble tiles, and you mix them all together. You put three names in, you can pull out 500. I actually did this in court uh, recently. And he's like, oh, that's good, but I don't know how I can show that on TV. So we kept going around trying to explain how we could show this on TV. And then a week before we finally did the show, I said, um, I'm going to send you four swabs. I think I brought some swabs here with me. And um, you can swab any four people if they just look like this. Any four people at Fox News, send them to my lab. We'll do their DNA and see if they, too, would be included by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation as rape suspects, according to the way Georgia does it. So, um, here is uh, this story. Let's see if we can. Okay, so how does a typical case work while well, he's trying to do this? Um, we have prisoners write to us, and uh, we're, we're well known enough that people will just write cold. And oftentimes, if you've gotten through these letters, uh, some of these folks are nearly illiterate. Some of them don't speak English, so they hire prison lawyers, that is, other prisoners who have some experience filing claims. And we have to go through all of those letters. We've gone through, I think, about 500 of them in Idaho. We had 3,500 or so in Georgia that we went through. And from those 3,500 cases, uh, we ended up taking, I think, uh, 10 or 12. And we've had uh, four exonerations there, five, five exonerations to date now. Um, so it's a lot of work on the screening effort. I don't know if we're going to get that up. And then um, once it finally gets to, to me, where we have uh, DNA evidence, that's where we have to have a motion for a new trial based, an extraordinary motion for a new trial based on newly discovered evidence. So we'd go into court with that. Gosh, it works so well in practice. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and what we'll do is, and maybe we have an auction for my books. <laughs> <laughs> I've got five copies. I'd be happy to sign them to whoever wants to donate to the uh, UK Innocence Network. So uh, you guys decide how to do that. Um, so, um, gosh, I don't know, are we going to be able to get this up? That's just bizarre. Okay. Yeah, I guess I'll just, I'll just keep that going. With this. So, um, what can we do with, with DNA in these cases? Well, I, sh I showed you the swab, and um, a another typical situation that you're going to run into is somebody already has a DNA sample that's been done from their crime scene. And they say they didn't do it, the labs made a mistake, and the statistics aren't that strong, and so you decide to retest. Um, in that case, I just go into the prison, swab the prisoner, and fortunately, I have my own laboratory with all the same equipment that the police agencies have, and we can run the prisoner sample. My lab. I did that just last week before I left on this trip, and a guy who was accused of raping a 64-year-old woman uh, he's a really nice guy, and everybody liked him, and his lawyer worked for him for years for free, and he was in a simple swap, and he, in fact, is not in So, uh, we also call ourselves the guilty project under those there. <laughs> Great, you want to crank it up a bit? Yeah, one of the two men that this guy pointed to that said he was one of the gang um, who, who raped this woman. And Kerry claims that even though they have DNA, um, he should not have been included in that, in that match and that the DNA is wrong. Now that's a very hard case to make, and nobody wanted to take his case for, for years. Um, but I took the <laughs> uh, The DNA crime lab has now What was really remarkable to me was that um, uh, George Heron, the head of the GBI, um, uh, you, you heard him there say that inconclusive is the same as cannot exclude. Now, in DNA, when they have mixtures, they have three possible findings. An exclusion, the person is excluded, the test is inconclusive, or they cannot exclude the person, and then they supply a statistic in the best cases. Sometimes they don't even do that. But those are the three, those are the only three conclusions. So if George Heron is putting two of those together, right, if it's if any time you don't get a result, it means, well, you can't exclude that person. Um, that's a serious problem. 
I mean, if I get a result for a cancer test that says inconclusive, I want my money back, right? That's not a that's not a test that worked. That's a test that failed. And it's the same thing in a reasonable DNA lab. I, I don't know if he didn't realize he was in a state that has a one-party recording law, uh, but he was talking on the phone to a reporter, and uh, that's what he said. It's, it's uh, to me, very frightening that um, somebody would have that point of view. Uh, so anyway, yeah, we were able to show, and I won't show you part two for now, but I will show you some other things um, that demonstrate how this all works. So uh, when you're working a case, typically, before you get to DNA, there is a presumptive uh, body fluid test that's done. So there's presumptive tests for blood, for uh, prostate-specific antigen, in the case of semen, for urine. There's presumptive tests for feces, saliva, amylase. Um, and what's very important to know about this, I just had a case where I finally uh, figured out what the problem is, what people don't understand is, if I get DNA from a stain, that's because there are cells there. There are little chunks of you that ended up outside of you. That's how we get DNA. Um, principally, the results we get are from cells that are transferred. They can die, but they came in as cells. If I test for semen, Right, I swab it to see if it's going to turn uh, blue or pink or whatever, to see if there's semen there. Then I'm testing for something that was produced in a gland and a prostate, and those cells didn't come out. They just make the juice, right? The juice gets out. Same thing with saliva. Your, your salivary glands stay there. They don't come out. The cells don't come out. It's just the juice. So there's not necessarily enough DNA to test just because you get a biological uh, presumptive for a biological fluid. So there's two separate types of testing. That's what the home infidelity PSA semen detection test kit is all about. Um, so the way that I found out about this, this is remarkable. I was uh, testifying in Virginia, and uh, as often happens when uh, an expert testifies, I was walking out during the break, and another lawyer had another case, came up to me during the break and said, I have something I want to talk to you about. And I figured he's got a, a case with DNA. So we get out into the hallway, and he opens up his briefcase, reaches in and he says, my wife is cheating on <laughs> And I say, gosh, I'm sorry. And he says, and there's, and there's this stain. And he starts telling me, you know, first of all, you're not wearing gloves, I'm not wearing gloves. Don't take it out. Uh, second of all, I don't do that stuff in my lap, but I bet if we get on the web, we'll find somebody who does just what you want. And that's how we found them. <laughs> now, this is a great slide because it really demonstrates the, the principles involved with biological testing. The first thing you do is a presumptive test for a biological fluid. Those, those cells did not leave the body. We're going to test for prostate-specific protein or antigen. The prostate gland, which you know I live blissfully knowing nothing about until rather recently, um, produces a lot of stuff. It produces fructose, for example, the same sugar that's found in fruit, because those sperm cells have to, you know, swim here across the Thames to get to where they want to get to, uh, and so they need energy. So it brings, it makes sugar and secretes that in the skin. It um, sends a buffer in, basically arm and hammer baking soda. It's a bicarbonate um, buffer because the vagina is a horrible place. If you're a sperm cell, it's very acid; it will kill you instantly unless you bring your own acid-killing buffer with you. And so the prostate supplies that. Um, it also supplies this prostate-specific antigen that nobody, I think, has found a uh, use for yet. I'm not sure, maybe someone has. I haven't looked at it lately. But um, it is a marker of prostate fluid only produced by the male um, uh, and, and with rare false positives only produced in semen. Okay. So, um, what you can do if you think your wife is cheating on your girlfriend, it only works if she's cheating with a male. <laughs> because we're, I know, it's limited testing, and so some of you are disappointed. But anyway, uh, because we are upright mammals, um, after sex, our females drain if there's been an ejaculation inside. You may have experienced this yourself. And um, so what happens? Well, there used to be this test in forensic science called the crust test, believe it or not. <laughs> Uh, I've never seen it printed, but I've talked to some of the old folks who work in the lab, and with ungloved hands, they would take the underwear of victims and see if there was some crust in there. Mm -hmm. And um, if there was, they would then get a swab and look at, see if there's actually sperm cells in that crust. Now that presents a problem to us post-conviction people, because we have to then get samples from whoever was working in the lab in 1983 that might have stuck their fingers in the underwear crust. 
Um, it's, uh, it makes it very difficult. But um, because we drain, because, well, you drain those, uh, into your parents, we can test those. And the first test is a presumptive test for prostate-specific antigen. And if the swab turns blue, lo and behold, there's some uh, prostate fluid. That's not a problem, you know, if I'm having sex with my girlfriend or wife. I would expect it to be. But that just tells me I can go to step number two to pay the three hundred and eighty-five dollars or whatever. And um, I can swab again with a clean swab, let it air dry, so you just moisten it with water, let it air dry. And now I've transferred some DNA. That's how easy it is to, to plant or to move or to transfer to test DNA. DNA is very easy to move. That's one of the principles of the substance. And I dry that and I send it off. And then I take the third swab in the kit. And I emphasize, take a clean swab, and I stick it in my mouth, right? And I wipe for about 10 seconds. I rub against the inside of my uh, cheek to get a buckle sample. I air dry that and send it off. Now, because we're looking for the male, I'm only interested in the male that, that deposited this. What chromosome am I going to look at? The Y chromosome, right? The males in the audience have brought a Y chromosome with them. The ladies, unless they're gray, did not bring a Y chromosome with them. I'm sorry to be graphic. <laughs> Actually not. It's the only way to keep people awake after work. So um, uh, they will then compare that Y chromosome, right, with the Y chromosome, the Y chromosome in my mouth, and the Y chromosome in the panties. Now when you do a Y chromosome test, there's a lot of great reasons to do that. Um, number one, it's, it's easier because you're just looking at a few markers. You're not you putting them all And number two, if you have a lot of female DNA, it's not going to cloud your results because she doesn't have a white chromosome. So I don't care that she's all over her own clothing. I just care that there's some Y chromosome in there. And this test works. It's used in court. Um, people do this all the time on stains all over the place. I saw one recently. Somebody had a stain from a car uh, that, that um, some of the guys, was a woman who got a stain from a car uh, and brought it into court. Um, Anyway, it does demonstrate all of those basic things. Any questions about this? I see a few people writing down a web address. I want. <laughs> this, uh, this is another thing that um, folks are doing all over the world. I have a Basque DNA, the Basque people from Spain. There's a lot of them in Idaho, and so we're studying their DNA. And it turns out, um, I gave a talk at a genealogy conference recently. A lot of people are doing this. Millions of people are sending in their DNA to these places and getting in touch with other people who kind of match their DNA. There's boards you can contact people. And there's also a surname project, so you can check if your last name tracks along with the white chromosome, which it usually does uh, fairly well. You can, you can establish a Jewish ancestry, which you might want to do for the right of return to Israel to show that you're Jewish. In America, you might want to show that you have Native American uh, heritage because you're open, you're eligible to certain scholarships. I don't know where students who do this. Uh, but this is the type of thing that's being done just by the top of Okay. Um, and since we still have the death penalty in the United States, it's us and some other nations that we're not generally grouped with, I'm embarrassed to say. Um, we've had a number of people exonerated. Now, these are not the all innocence project cases or uh, DNA cases, and that's why this number is larger. These are all people um, who have been released from prison completely, not just had their sentences commuted, whatever. And uh, there's one guy from Idaho. He might fit my little state right there, ID. And he's one of my clients. I didn't get him out. Uh, his lawyer, Fred Hoops, who was very persistent, got him out. We're working with him on compensation. Um, and uh, that's, that's Charlie Second from the left up there. All the way to the left is my assistant director, the only paid person at the Idaho Innocence Project. He's a lawyer and a great friend. And these, the rest of these folks are my student interns. So um, Charlie Fain was uh, arrested for rape, kidnap, rape, and murder of a nine-year-old girl in the town next to the one I live in. Uh, presently, he did uh, 18 years in uh, uh, in Idaho on death row. Death row in Idaho means you never have anyone in your cage with you. They did for like uh, a day. They stuck someone in this cage with them, I guess. Uh, so the only place you see people is when you go out, what they call outside, which is your kind of caged walkway, and you can see guys across from you and stuff. So he spent 18 years like that. And you might imagine what kind of job training we give people who are going to kill, right? Nothing. So he spent 18 years in prison, no job training. His lawyer Fred Hoops persisted in getting some hairs that were left on the body tested. They get the first one tested in Canada, 
The officials in the U.S. say, ah, it's a Canadian lab. <laughs> you get to the second one tested in the U.S. lab, they object to that. They get a third one tested in the U.S. lab, a different U.S. lab, and this time um, the Attorney General in our state says, we have a problem, because all three match. They're all three from potentially the same contributors. That was mitochondrial DNA, which we will talk about. But um, so Charlie was free. Now, Calvin Johnson, who I wrote the book with, I think the, the, in Georgia, we have a special act of the state legislature to compensate them. So they gave him $600,000, out of which he had to pay for his DNA test, etc. Charlie Payne, 18 years on death row, what do you think his compensation from my sweet state is? <laughs> Um, they took him to the prison laundry and allowed him to pick out a pair of dungarees and a jacket. That was it. Um, and um, you know, the, the problems only kind of compound when these people get out because no one erases their record from the website. It still says murder or sex offender. I got a call from a friend who was in Miami with my children at Christmas, and a friend of mine said, Greg, you know about this stuff. I'm at this church supper, and there's this guy there, and our hostess asked us to tell a story about Christmas. We went around the room and it got to this guy, Charlie, and he said uh, that even though the guards shouldn't have, they gave him a sausage one year at Christmas on death row. <laughs> and I looked him up and he killed a nine-year-old. My friend is a nine-year-old. I'm like, oh, that's Charlie Payne. He's fine. And I haven't heard of flying. He's a great guy. He's very quiet. Uh, but anyway, so we're working with him for compensation. If he had been a murderer, by the way, who had been paroled, he would have had job services, health care, housing services. Um, but that's another thing that you'll have to face when you get these people out. When we first started doing it in Georgia, our clients got out of prison. We lost track of them. Most of them lived in a car that someone gave them, drove it around without insurance or registration because they didn't have a job or money or training or anything. Um, so now we help them when they get out too. Um, that's the book. I'll just go quickly over it because we want to drive the bidding up for the, uh, for the um, donation to the UK project. But uh, in Calvin's case, there was science. Um, the science was a victim's ID. The victim ID him from a six-pack, what we call a six-pack, which is six photos that are shown. Um, and in that picture, um, all the men were clean-shaven because the victim said the man who raped him was clean-shaven. Calvin Johnson had a beard at the time. He had his boss come in and say he had this beard that he showed up with at the trial, full beard. Um, he had his work ID that was taken about the time of the raid that showed he had a full beard. Everybody agreed he had a full beard. Um, and the victim's description said, well, he could have had stubble when she was asked about facial hair. No, no mustache, no beard, could have been stubble. This guy had a, had a full beard. It didn't matter. Um, the jury was able to find him guilty. And then they found three pubic hairs. They only disclosed one of them to the defense, but they actually found three pubic hairs in this white woman who had been raped in her bed. They were Negroid pubic hairs, and they didn't match Calvin Johnson, according to the uh, state expert who still works over there, uh, more than 20 years later. Um, and the prosecution said, well, she could have picked those hairs up in the line. Um, the science, forensic science, was that about 70% of us are what's called secretors. So, you know, look around. Most of you are secretors. That means when you spit, when you leave vaginal fluid, when you leave semen, when you leave um, any kind of body fluid behind, it has your blood type in it. Non-secretors, we can't tell what their blood type is. So this was the type of science that was done to match people to um, semen slides back in uh, the time that this, uh, in the early 80s when this happened. And Calvin Johnson is an O-positive secretor, just like the person who inseminated this victim, but so is 30% of the black population. Now this demonstrates the second point. Any time you hear it's a match, you should have one very important question. Anybody want to guess what the very important question is? I say we found type 1 collagen on the handle of the knife used to kill the victim, and your client has type 1 collagen, what do you ask? Who else has type 1 collagen? Who is excluded? Now, that's where some of the newest DNA stuff gets very dodgy. For example, the low copy number um, DNA, which uh, uh, was just um, defeated in the California courts, uh, was excluded um, uh, before trial. But, but it's accepted here, um, New York State is allowed in a few other places. And low copy number means you have so little DNA that you, you don't get the whole profile. 
and you might have some stuff added in kind of in the noise that looks like a real part of the profile. It's kind of confusing. And so a lot of times you don't get a statistic. They just say we cannot exclude this person from that sample, kind of like what George was doing. If you don't have a statistic, you fight it. If there's no math, there is no match. No math, there's no match. That's got to be the line that, that um, everybody draws in the sand. There is no science of cannot exclude. You have to, you can say that, but then what is the statistic? So I mentioned this in Georgia. We went through, you know, by the time this was written, uh, 3,200 letters, uh, six cases closed, four exonerations, two cases where we found out the person was truly guilty. Most of the innocence projects that I know, um, generally about half of the people they finally get down to testing are in fact guilty, or at least the evidence says um, you know, cannot exclude, and we generally drop them at that point if the statistic is good. This is my first George Innocence Project case. Um, God will forever bless me for it. And um, this client made drawings for everybody. The innocence Project he likes to draw cats and all kinds of things. We spent a lot of time, we had to drive six or eight hours to get to the Florida border, the Georgia-Florida border where he was in jail. Met with him, met with his family or his supporters, and um, were not able to get a result the first time. Now, we work with local lawyers as well. We always have a local lawyer who knows the courtroom, who knows the judges, so we don't fly in people from the capital city to overwhelm these little communities when we have to file a motion. And in this case, we had a Georgia divorce lawyer Georgia is one of the few states that has jury trials for divorces still. So these guys have to take the lowest of low things in the law. They're the ones who find every piece of dirt and uh, set people up and tempt them into situations you know, they're meant to show their weakness of character. It's really an awful business. So this guy was so excited, this volunteer lawyer, that he refused to go through our normal process, which was FedExing the evidence. He hired an airplane. He paid the sheriff's assistant two days to fly with him to North Carolina from Georgia to go to uh, Bodie to get this tested. They test it, and we get no result. So the next step is a guy uh, who's a bit cantankerous, and uh, uh, sometimes some people find him a little challenging to work with, but he does the best DNA in the country, um, Ed Blake. And he found sperm on this old slide, actually I think on the swab that the slide was made from, and the stick on the end of the cotton swab, and um, matched Joe Brown at eight um, low side plus um, one of the little other So we ended up dropping that case. Uh, in other words, the front page of the newspaper uh, lambasted this, <laughs> this divorce lawyer for bringing this up again and um, uh, wasting all our time. But anyway, I'm very happy when we get any kind of result because then I can sleep. You know, I don't have to pursue this for the rest of the time. Um, Pete Williams demonstrates some other points about this. This is Cliff Williams' case, no relation. The, one of the students I told you about who persisted, even though they said that all of the boxes had been destroyed, all the rape kits were destroyed in 1990. So Cliff goes and requests, he actually goes down to the GBI, and the GBI says, look, we've already sent the official letter to Amy Maxwell, the head of the, the Georgia Innocence Project. All kits were destroyed. And, and I think it's signed by George Aaron, who unfortunately was also part of that, that tape recording you heard. And, and George does a lot of great work. I don't mean to slam here. But, um, so they signed this official letter, apparently, and mailed it. And, then, and, and Cliff went in again the next day, and that's when he asked, can you just do a manual check? He comes back to the Innocence Project, says, she found it. The box is there. You know, we can test it. And of course, everybody's ecstatic. And the next day, the official letter from the Georgia Group Investigation arrives stating that they had destroyed the box. You know, it hadn't been destroyed. They, they were just going administrative. Again, you're jumping into a manure pile, right? And you're not looking for a golden nugget. You're looking for a geo that you still have to you know, split and polish. It's very, very tough work. Cliff was on two exonerations out of the four in Georgia, or uh, well, five now, uh, And he, um, he really deserves that. Now, just to show you how interesting these cases get, so in Pete Williams' case, there was a series of rapes that continued happening after um, he was arrested. At least that's what the defense heard. They go to the prosecutor, Fred Tokars, and they say, Fred, isn't this continuing? The defense lawyer said, no, 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 we're not getting it. This was a guy who carjacks, and he asks for a particular name, and then he rapes the women. And everybody knew that this same character was doing these rapes. Uh, but the prosecutor denies that it happened, Fred Tokars. So um, you get 
Pete convicted, he will never say he did it. And so in Georgia, he should have done maybe 14, 16 years. If he said he's sorry, he wouldn't say he was sorry. He didn't do it. Fred Tokars, while I was in Georgia, becomes a judge. Um, uh, shoe prints, um, uh, lip prints, ear prints. Are they all unique? I can tell you that if we all did lip prints or teeth fit into a cup here, you would be able to pick your own out if you had one to match it, and so could everybody else. But there's one thing lacking in that match. What do you always ask when there's a match? What's the statistic? How many other people in the general population would match this bite mark? There are no statistics for those things. In fact, there's no statistics for fingerprints either, which has gotten the fingerprint people uh, quite excited. But um, anyway, there's a lot of bad signs as well as bad things. And then I'm going to show you a case that demonstrates this fact in the next slide, I think better than um, just me describing the facts. So, um, victim ID. It's horrible. I was mugged in Connecticut. I refused. I, I was mugged. I ran into the club. I left my friends behind, including my former high school girlfriend. I just left everybody because I know you run when you get mugged. So I ran and I got a cop. And the cops came out. And I ran back out and he got the guy's license plate as he ran into his car and drove off. So they mugged uh, me and my three friends. And I gave it to the police and they called me up a week later and said, will you come down to ID the guy? And I said, well, how are we going to do it? Like, We're going to have a, you know, a little walk for them with there are six guys and you just have to pick the kid. And I was like, it was a white kid with a baseball cap. <laughs> so that's 60% of my students. You know, I can't, I'll confuse them for somebody else. I'm not going to show up. They're like, look, you have the license plate. You have a description. If you just pick the right guy, it'll be great evidence. I'm like, and if I pick the wrong guy? They're like, it won't, nothing. There's no penalty. I'm like, I'm on my conscience. <laughs> and, um, but I was just amazed. I'm like, gosh, I mean, I can just go in there and play guy roulette, right? White kid with cat roulette. And it doesn't, there's no penalty to me whatsoever for launching an investigation of one of these people or confirming a police belief. These are terrible. Over and over again, more than 70% of the exonerations include faulty ID. So here, let me show you a picture. This was my last exoneration in Georgia. A man named John White. So a 74-year-old woman is um, raped and badly beaten. They recover sperm, sperm from her body, semen with sperm. 19-year-old um, John White is a suspect. They bring him down to the police station. There are some other characters in the police station for whatever reason. Not, they're not suspects. And uh, so they do a lineup. The woman had described a guy who had sort of um, uh, hunched shoulders, uh, a mustache of some sort. And so when you do a lineup, you're supposed to do to the description the victim gave you, not to match the suspect, right? But the description the victim gave you. And so they knew John White was a suspect, and he knew he was a suspect. And they said, John, where do you want to stand? And John is your worst nightmare, right? The innocent claim. This is so typical of innocent claim. I'm going to stand right in the middle with my white t shirt, right? Up this. Look at that. And he knows he's not, nobody's going to pick, pick him. He's innocent. This old lady was raped. She's not going to pick me. She picked him. She said, It's the guy in the middle. It's John. They go to trial. Pretty much, that's the evidence. Um, you know, there's all the usual crap that's thrown into a uh, trial to make it last a long But pretty much it's her ID. She was beaten badly. And there's nothing like a witness, especially a 74-year-old woman, pointing to a young man and saying, I am absolutely certain that's the one who raped me. Juries don't often find against that type of thing. Here's the amazing thing. We got him out because we tested the rape kit. And this guy... No one knows why he was in this lineup. Uh, at least I haven't been able to find out. He was in the police station for something else. Look at his face. Right? I mean, I wish I had a truth detector. I wish I knew how to tell people in the lineup which one was guilty. But that dude looks like he is counting his, his blood states, you know, hoping he's not going to be picked. And uh, in fact, he wasn't picked. He went home, and um, after we did this case, we got a hit even in the database or something else, but he was out free, and they, they made an arrest um, in his case. But I think they, I think they got wrong charges because they, you know, 20 years later they can't find uh, witnesses. Obviously, the 74-year-old woman is probably not going to make a great witness 
after a couple decades. But that just shows me, you know, that's my one example of how bad this situation gets. Not only will they pick a bad random person, but even if you gave the person who actually raped you in a line, you could pick the wrong person. Um, and if you don't believe me, read the book Picking Cotton, which just came out about a, a victim and her uh, alleged attacker who was exonerated after two trials. Um, or he was found guilty of both. Uh, wrote a book together, and it's pretty amazing. Uh, all right, so we'll play a little facial recognition game. This was in Atlanta, Georgia. See, see who can pick it out. That's Calvin, my co-author, in the middle of uh, me, obviously. And um, this guy shows up at the fundraiser, shows up a little bit early. So we, um, we pick him up at the airport. He's, he's flown in with his private jet and two uh, pilots who take him everywhere. And he's very generous. He came and did some fundraising for us at the Georgia Innocence Project. And on the way, this is the clue, on the way, um, we're passing the, or they're passing the, uh, the bookstore, and he asks our, our driver, who's one of our volunteers, do you mind if we stop in the bookstore? We have a little time. We're early. I want to go inside. So they go inside, and some young clerk comes up with his manager laying along, and, they, and he says, um, I'm in town for a talk tonight, and I wanted to know if I could sign some. Excuse me, sir, I have another customer. He left, and he goes, takes time, he's coming back. And it comes back to our guest and says, uh, what were you saying? I'm in town, uh, and I'm giving a talk, and I was wondering if I might sign a few books before I, I go on. And right behind him is this poster. <laughs> Does anyone know who that is? It's John Grisham. He sold 250 million books. <laughs> <laughs> so again, you know, identification. I'm sure a few of them were at Barnes & Noble. You know, probably the Barnes & Noble book in Atlanta. Uh, but it just goes to show you know, we're not as good at identifying people even in our own field. So it's probably so what can we do about it? Well, these were some of the um, uh, Justice Department recommendations that um, Massachusetts just agreed to. And um, I'm not going to go into detail, but there's good practices. And I won't go into detail because I don't know what the particular issues are here. And I've been told five minutes to wrap up. How good is DNN? At 25% of the cases, it exonerates the primary suspect, the person who's sent in by the police. Now, you wonder, what do we do before DNA at this point? Uh, but um, clearly the labs are doing their jobs. And I don't at all want to sign any of the labs. I think they do great work. They put a lot of guilty people behind bars. If you want to get into this work, it's very, very hard. Uh, but I, I think it's, it's worth it. Once you take it on, it's very hard to shake it off. Um, uh, once you uh, start dealing with some of these people who are suffering under unimaginable conditions. And in fact, I think the people that I get out um, have something wrong with them because I think a normal person would have committed suicide. And in fact, I had a guy in Georgia, I, I'm sure we were getting him out, and before we could get him out, he committed suicide. Um, it's a very desperate situation to be painted as someone, as a criminal, to be innocent, and no one believes you. Many times these people's families don't believe in that well, or certainly abandon them, uh, or encourage them to say they did it, as Calvin Johnson, uh, his parents, and his father did. Um, and I'm just going to end with... Um, the clip then from this last um, thing from Fox News so you can see how it worked out. Because in the end, it's, uh, if it's going to go, we'll see. Um, in the end, it's all storytelling. I mean, it's all, you've got to convince somebody that you're right, that um, your guy really is innocent. And I, I was just, I just lucked into this by suggesting this guy that we should test. I think that's enough of that. Um, I don't know if we have time for questions, but I, I'll stick around in any case. Thank you.